in various capacities I've done this speech or this presentation. When I was active duty for in Bethesda, Center for Brain Health in Dallas, um, done it for in the last year. Patriots, the Golden State Warriors, the Pelicans, uh, the Pirates, the Blue Jays, the Canadian National bobsled team, and very on and on and on and on. And I say that only because, not because it's 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 cool to do those things, which it's kind of it's kind of neat to see behind the the uh, curtain a little bit. But uh, this this all of this is a byproduct of my teachers, and uh, I think that. In my profession, and I'll get a little bit back in my, my background, in my profession as a strength coach and exercise physiologist, people harp a little bit too much on who they train, and I think that that's a little bit uh, lowbrow. So real quick background, grew up in a, uh, on a dirt road in Iowa, and uh, my family still lives there. No real history of the military. My dad was in, was in Vietnam, but wasn't really a, much of a, a push to join the military. And, but I had that bug, and it obviously got me. It got me after grad school, though. I was, in, I was a strength coach at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I uh, stayed on as a grad student and a strength coach. Before I came into the Navy, uh, I chose to enlist, and uh, thus begun, began my 11-year, I guess, uh, venture away from home. Uh, 17 combat deployments, on and on and on. I don't know. My, I guess my prestigiously, I have 22 concussions. I guess that's really kind of, and that's really where this comes from. So uh, I don't talk about my past at all. Yes, I was there, and yes, I was there too. Um, but again, the shelf life of that is about that long because the reality is, is nobody gives a damn. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just not, the, I got out because, again, it, it all tied together, so bear with me. This is my monologuing bit. But uh, I have an eight-year-old. Well, nine, not, he's now nine. He's why I do this. So he was my salvation. And I'll get into that because I, I think a lot of us, regardless of the age group we're in um, and our experience level, uh, some or all of this will make sense to you in one capacity or another. So without further ado, we're just going to kind of jump into it. Sometimes this presentation turns into a conversation, and I fully encourage that because this tends to elicit a lot of emotion in a lot of people because I'm going to give you the answer of why, it, why this is happening. And I think that's the big thing that, you know, being in the military, it's do, 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 and it's why are we doing this because I told you, which is fine, but as you become a senior member in the military or um, you begin thinking for, your, for yourself at some point, you really begin to ask why. And this is, this is my eight-year venture, active duty eight years. Now I've been out for two years, so really 10-year venture of, of why. So just reiteration, master's degree exercise physiology and chemistry, I, it does, all that means is that I endured college. Um, things I learned after the fact are, uh, in my, my opinion, far more relevant. My, my business is Virginia Beach, and it's called Virginia High Performance. That's my one and only plug I'll give you. But uh, we, uh, I, I have my hands in a little bit of everything. But again, I spend most of my time with kids, and that's my way of keeping the stress way down. So the goal to this, in really simple terms, I try to keep my cursing to a minimum, but sometimes I, I myself get pretty passionate about it. But there's so much misinformation about a lot of the things I'm going to cover, and usually it's based off of ignorance, uh, because this is, was a difficult task uh, for me to uncover a lot of these things, it, it meant I had to fly all over the world, spend a lot of the government's money, and figuring out why, not just myself, because this isn't necessarily just about me. There's, there's so many of people, so many people like me, active duty or even otherwise. So in high sport, in, in high academia, in, 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 in big business, you encounter these sort of things. So it's hard to really kind of give it a term, and depending on whom, whom I'm speaking to, I tend to change it around a little bit. But... Quite simply, I'm going to empower you guys with information because I have found that, you know, it's hard enough to hold somebody accountable for anything unless you inform them, let alone yourself. It's like sleep and stress. It's like a relationship. It's really hard to audit when you're in it, right? But when you get out of that relationship, good, bad, or indifferent, you're like, oh, 
I totally see what went wrong there, okay? And so that's really kind of what, what stress and sleep for me was about. Um, and then, again, I, I didn't discover this by happenstance. Um, I'll get into that. Okay, so here's, here, here's where the... Uh, I put this analogy up there because this is where it began to make sense for me. I was uh, due directly in part of my lifestyle within the, within the Navy. Um, I was experiencing some really bad issues with sleep, pain. I was being given heroin for pain. Um, if, you, if you've taken it before, I've been given it, or I was taking too much of it. Just for me to go out on an op, um, our typical, you know, wake up. We slept during the day, went out at night. My breakfast consisted of about 30 milligrams of, of morphine just to get out of bed. Go do our, do our op board. That was our brief. Um, eat a little bit. Take another 10 milligrams of morphine getting on the helo. Take another 10 milligrams getting off the helo. Take another 10 milligrams at the set point before action. So about 70 milligrams of morphine just to do my job. Get back. And uh, then I would get on electro stim, or I'd sit in an ice bath whilst, whilst taking every sort of opiate you can imagine to include, uh, I was being, like I said, I was given heroin nine times because I couldn't, I couldn't walk. Um, there was a, <clears throat> a time where I was walking through Jalalabad. It doesn't snow there very often, but I was walking butt naked through the snow in Jalalabad, and they found me in the cafeteria having a conversation with that, really, the KBR, um, chicken cordon bleu that we're so used to. <laughs> so that was my experience with, uh, my first experience with heroin. So, that, so bear with me here. So stress, um, stress, good or bad, terrible, benign, compounding stress, it is this. This is the simplest way to put it. And I can get as into the weeds as much as I can or as you'd like me to, but this is a really good analogy. So Stress sets neural pathways, okay? It is, it is a chemical-induced sort of pattern that happens. Good, bad, what are you, what's alcohol, it's tobacco, it's stress, it's, it's weight training, whatever it is, okay, happiness. They all elicit a certain reaction, okay? And our life, our life, if you turn your car on and your car is in a good, good state, most cars will idle around 1,000 RPM, a little bit low, depending on the make and model, okay? And that's our, that's our nervous system. The thing is, is when something's going wrong with that car, that car will begin to idle a little bit quicker, a little bit quicker, okay? And if there's something really wrong with it, it may not start. But for this purpose of this analogy, what I will say is that for those of us in the military, um, in my lifestyle, you know, the, the car actually will, will, it will perform really, really well at seven, 8,000 RPM in context of this image right here. Okay, but staying there for a really long time is not very viable. The problem with it, with the human body is, is especially for, in my, in, my, in my position in the military, I was always getting ramped up to the nine and 10. Always, always, always. But when you get up in the nine and 10, <clears throat> that neurological, chemical, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine response is really, really, it's large by volume, okay? If like, again, if you wanna put it in nanograms per milliliter, whatever, there's a lot, okay? And that tends to set neural pathways, okay? But think of, basically, when you, when you don't really think it because it's subconscious, but just moving your arms. It's subconscious, but shooting, moving, stress, all those sort of things, you learn, they're learned behaviors. <clears throat> when that stress is really, really high, you learn really fast, really fast, because it, it becomes so imprinted in your, your nervous system. The problem with it is when you're up in eight, nine, 10 all the time, all the time, like I was, um, my, my idol became three or 4,000, okay? I could get right back up to nine, but I could never get back down to homeostasis because my new norm was just always go, hypervigilant, anxious, irritable. Quite frankly, I was a really, really awful person to be around. I was really, really violent to everybody, to include my family. I, was, I, was, I did some bad things to some bad people, and I did some really bad things to some good people, and... I, I, I very much hit my breaking point. So that's, that's the deal is we are so conditioned to ramp up, 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 we can't come back down. And when you can't come back down, and we'll get into it here in a minute, 
there is very much a cause and effect, and I'm going to link that cause and effect for you. <clears throat> the thing is, is if you use it in the context of a car again, any one of our cars, if it's in good working order, we can put the car in neutral and we can rev it up to about 3,000 RPM. And that can be sustained for a really long time. Okay, admitted, that's, that's what the, the, the beauty of the human body, it can be sustained for a really long time. But, but not as long as you might think, okay? Especially if there's been some wear and tear in that car, right? Which tends to happen in, in, in for us, for those of us that are or were in the military. There's a lot of wear and tear. So keep this kind of in mind of what's happening. Like we're not able to get down to our sleep level, which is that idol, okay? It's necessary. Okay. It's hard to, hard to uh, label some of these things. Like I, I put emotional is up there, but <clears throat> it can be anything. It can be physical, and we'll get there. I'm going to list some physical things, some manifestations of stress, and what happens. And, and every one of you is going to go, okay, I always thought that was just something that I always had to deal with. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean here in a minute. So two, two terms that I want you to get, get to know a little bit. One is sympathetic, and the other one is parasympathetic. Okay, sympathetic means stress. Simply, it just means when you're under stress, your nervous system becomes very sympathetic, becomes sensitive, it becomes very hypervigilant. We get um, some other physical manifestations, and I won't get ahead of myself, but um, and it'll, so again, these are all, this won't, just so you know, this won't make sense until you see all the slides, okay? So just bear with me. This is a bit of a journey. Um, this is my way of, my OCD way of articulating it. And then parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the response to that sympathetic, that stress, okay? Think of it kind of as an acid and a base. Too much acid, not enough base, you still stay acidic, okay? Or that RPM, okay? If you don't take your foot off the gas pedal, even if you're not as sympathetic as stressed out, you're still stressed out a little bit, okay? So I may use these terms, um, so that's what we know. So sympathetic, stress, parasympathetic, chilling out, okay? And we're so, and the military has taught us one thing, probably above all else, especially in the training, and that's be, that's be reactive, okay? Now, that's a very, 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 very good thing in the military, but that, that reactive response tends to not bode very well for our social, emotional, and our family lives. So it's hard to kind of get that foot off the gas pedal because here's the deal. When we're talking about the RPMs, and, and I know anyone in this room that has deployed and that is having issues We've all, I believe I've got them, still deal with them. Issues is not a bad thing. But uh, sometimes that gas, pushing that gas feels good, and that's the problem, right? That's why sometimes it's even harder to come off that high, okay? Because being reactive feels really good, especially when you're trained yourself or you've been trained or just the combination of who you are as a person and the training that you've encountered. I was, I enjoyed being an asshole, for some, it was my safeguard, okay, for, to, for me to do my job. But, again, that's not very good for um, my social life, uh, my married life, and definitely not for my, my young boy at the time. So I'm going to throw some terms in here just so we get, we get familiar with them. So cortisol. Cortisol, again, that acid-base thing. We're talking about that parasympathetic, sympathetic. Is testosterone, good to some degree. Cortisol counteracts that, okay? Cortisol goes up, a lot of things go down. A lot of things go down that we want. Growth hormone, testosterone, serotonin, norepinephrine, all those sort of things. Sex drive, libido, list goes on and on when cortisol goes up, okay? That's so why I have tests. Testosterone, good, very, very much affected, even by the emotional state, okay? Um, and, and I'll get into why that is. It's all linked. It's pretty simple, and so just bear with me. Medications. That includes all pain, all opiates. Okay, that also includes Lunesta, Ambien, any sort of behavior or emotional uh, changing drugs for depression. I'm not, now, don't, don't mishear me. I am not bastardizing any of these sort of things. I'm not one that says sugar's the devil or fats. No. Used in context of how they're meant to be prescribed and consumed, they are useful. The problem is, is that, me included, um, I got so used to taking them for me to do my job that it, it, it came back around, losing my hair, losing my teeth, fingernails falling out, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, all those sort of things with, by the look of me, relatively no trauma, okay? 
So um, don't, don't mistake me when I'm saying, hey, these are, these are this and these are bad. That's not it. It's just this is a discovery. So sleep, right, that's the big one. Okay, if I, I can get anybody's attention in any room and go, I can guarantee you I can improve your sleep without taking any medication. Almost everybody will either think I'm full of shit or I'll just get their attention either way. Okay, so bear with me on that. Sunlight, travel, how does that affect? Okay, we've all heard setting circadian rhythm, the impact of vitamin D, norepinephrine, serotonin, all those sort of things. I can make that link, but in, so I don't get all over the place because Keep in mind, this is 10 years of information I'm trying to put in like 14 slides. So I had to kind of pick some things. Um, travel in the military, I averaged 308 days gone for 11 years. That's what I averaged gone. So I traveled a little bit. Um, and uh, it affected, it, affa it very much affects us. And for those of us that travel even east to west coast sometimes, getting back on rhythm can be difficult. So. Um, especially when you see four or five countries in one day, that tends to be a problem. Diet very much affects us. I'm not a registered dietitian, nor am I a sports dietitian, but diet, we are how we train and how our lives are, and we are what we eat, very much so. And family and work, okay? Those tend to kind of converge a little bit, but family can, and I always say this, family can very much bring you up. Um, family can bring you down, not because it's the family's problem, but because it can be like a source of, I'm letting them down, and it re when you get in that position where you're like, I'm really letting my family down, it really drives you to kind of the, a new low. At least it did me. Breathing techniques. So here's, here's, here's the terms I want you to start burning into your brain. Diaphragm and vagus nerve, okay? I'm going to very much get into these. So I'm going to kind of plant this seed, and I'm going to back up a little bit. But just under, these are just kind of like, here's the definitions we're going to start going over a little bit. Okay. Little history lesson. No, I did not know Mr. Pavlov. He, um, he was around a little bit before I was. So we've all probably heard of the Pavlovian response. Okay, the bell, the dog. We've, if you've seen the television show The Office with Dwight and the, like the jelly bean or something, right? It's the same idea where it's bottom line. It's a conditioned response. For the, anybody here, you don't have to show hands. I'm not asking about participation yet. For, but for those of us in here that read before we go to bed. What happens when you read when you get on an airplane? You sleep, okay? It's a conditioned response. It's Pavlovian, okay? So just to give you a little background, because this is going to come right back around, of, of why this is so important. Pavlov was a brilliant, brilliant physiologist, okay? He was researching digestion. That's all you really kind of need to know about that, because we're going to Re revisit this in a minute. So think of digestion. Digestion, like, okay, what the, what the heck does I have to do with stress? Bear with me because it's going to blow your mind. It did mine. So in context of the image you see, if you don't know who Pavlov was, basically he was seeing if he could get a condition. He was noticing that his animals, it was actually a lab coat, not a bell. Every time the lab technicians would come in to feed the dogs, the dogs would start drooling. He, they, the dogs began to associate the white coat with food. Okay, And then he saw that he got the idea, and he's like, well, what if we start banging a stick or ringing a bell or something, he continued to get the same response, okay? So thus, the condition response. And all the time he was studying digestion, right? He just saw this and noticed it and began to run it, basically a side study. So keep that in mind. Digestion, drooling. That's all I'm going to say, okay? <laughs> like, I was totally losing me. All right. So physical manifestations, no. There are a lot of manifestations of stress that we won't see because they're at the chemical level. However, I'm going to tell you that <clears throat> the heart, obviously, is a very powerful organ, right, uh, without being super rhetorical. The, the nerve, essentially, the, the nerve body that runs the cadence of your heart from stress is your SA node, it's your pacemaker, okay? That pacemaker has one nerve intervention to your spine. So brain to spine to heart, single nerve intervention, okay? Your stomach has seven, okay? No, no other than your brain, no other organ has more, any, any greater nerve sensitivity based off nerve intervention, of basically like what's going on in the body. So if you look at this, this list of physical manifestations of stress, Stress can be a good thing, right? Like I, as an athlete growing up, every time I, I swam competitively since I was four years old, was a, uh, and then I played baseball and through college, every time I'd smell chlorine, I'd have to pee, 
Okay, it just became a very much a stress response. So, frequent urination, diarrhea, constipation. If you experience any of these in a moment of stress, it's normal, okay? It's not, well, this just is what I do. So I encounter this a lot with professional athletes. Uh, one of the Pirates uh, players had a long conversation with him. Every time he would do two things. He'd go to a game or he really enjoyed weight training, specifically legs day, he'd always get diarrhea, okay? So cause effect, okay? Good or bad, but here's the deal. So is, if, if, if anyone in here has ever been asked to keep a sleep study or you go see a dietitian, and the dietitian says, keep me, give, give me a food log for like three to five days. Inevitably, inevitably, the sleep tends to improve and the diet cleans up. Okay, because you take from the subconscious, bring to the conscious, you become aware of what's going on, bang. Okay, so when we, I began engaging this conversation with the player from the Pirates and I was like, this is what's happening. This is why he stopped having to poop. Okay, so once, I think I kind of heard it, the last, the last speaker is basically, it's like, once, it bec once you know an issue is an issue, you, it, st it stops taking control of your life. All right, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it was something in that context, yeah? Okay, that's the nervous system. The nervous system owns you until you own it. Yawning, anyone here, this is kind of rhetorical, anyone here has ever been in a weight room, been on a run, any sort of training, and they start yawning? That is your nervous system, that is your brain trying to prepare the body for stress. How many of us fight that yawn off? Bad idea, don't embrace it. Yawn as big as you can, okay? Your body will prepare itself for stress better. We'll get there, okay? And this, this becomes more of a kind of a dialogue at some point, but I'm kind of telling you, giving you the roadmap here. These are all, I kind of, kind of try to list them in like order of what may, or, so upset stomach, loss of appetite, Worst case, nausea, vomiting, okay? Those are all levels of stress. If you're training and you're throwing up, get a new coach because that person is doing a terrible job, okay? That is your body telling you you are doing a really, really bad job of training, okay? Vomiting is not a badge of honor. It's ignorance, okay? There's a time and a place because it, it'll happen sometimes when stress gets so high. Um, it's, it's inevitable, but if it's a common occurrence, you should think about training or firing your coach. Nervousness, butterflies, ang ang being anxious, anxiety, those sort of that, that, that visceral feeling, okay? That is your, your stomach, specifically, that gut feeling is saying, hey, get ready, here it comes, here comes the stress. Acid reflux, heartburn, indigestion, ulcers, all linked to different levels of, of discomfort and nervous system, um, sort of manifestation of discomfort and pain. Hunger, unquenchable thirst, dry mouth, okay? Being sleepy is very much, and so every single time for the last seven or eight years that we would go do something work-related when I was in the Navy, I put my head, put my earplugs in. I had just a little like fitted Invisio earpiece that I would I'd have. I'd put that in <coughs> before I, I actually take it out, let it hang. I put two EarPro in. If, if anyone's ever been on a CH-47 Chinook, they are ridiculously loud, but that is the best sleep I've ever had in my life. Every time I got on a helicopter, boom. And what would wake me up was 10 minutes out, they'd test fire the weapon, or 10 minutes into it, they'd test fire the guns, then it'd wake you up, but then it stopped waking me up. I'd sleep through, I'd sleep through a minigun, test fire two of them. And then I would just get, <clears throat> I don't know what it was, it was just, we always knew, always knew how long we were gonna fly in, and without fail, when they would, they would inherently they'd do, they'd do, we'd do a, basically a, a, a test like, hey, you know, checking in, I just put my, my mirror piece in, I'd be wide awake. So stress can make you sleepy and vice versa. It can keep, you, keep, keep us off, obviously. Hiccups happens, okay? And people tend to hold their breath too, right? We get, we get scared to go, <gasps> and you don't even know it, but you hold your breath, okay? So these right here are a whole bunch of physical manifestations that do happen to you on a daily brace, basis. Get in a fight with your girlfriend, get shot at, get stabbed, talk with your ex-wife, like in my case, these all tend to happen. Um, you also, on the flip side of it, like my nine-year-old son, I spend a couple minutes with him. I, I, I love in life, okay? So these things can also be, but understanding that they happen, they're, they're gonna happen. Bear with me here, okay? Here's, here's the big statement. We put so much emphasis on the, phys, the, the, the state of physical readiness, okay? But I'm here to tell you that factually, 
you, you can replace the word rec with re recovery, with wellness, with happiness, with performance, with anything, okay? <clears throat> Only, because again, we, we wouldn't, most people, wouldn't ever think of just rolling out of bed and just going, going into, into an intense bout of training, okay? To some degree, we are going to begin to prepare our physical body to endure that stress, okay? Stretch, warm up, have some food, what, any combination of things, okay? But yet, we will go, we will put ourselves into a physical, a, 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 an incredibly stressful sort of environment physically without even giving it a single thought. Just be like, well, this is my job demands. I'm just going to go do it, you know, like, like, like a lemming. Um, and again, all, all of us are guilty of it, to include myself. You just kind of get so used to that hamster wheel, and you just jump in and see, and then you become very reactive, okay? The greater the preparation for the mind, the greater the adaptation, okay? Because here, here's, here's the conundrum, is that the human body, specifically the brain, is so magnificent that it will adapt, okay? We are so used to being at deficit and still being a high performer, okay, that we just go, you know what, I'm I, top of the food chain, I can still endure it, okay? Um, I, th that's where my mind was at. I had gone through so many different selection courses. I couldn't go up anymore from, in my, from my standpoint in the military. I was a senior leader. I was a master breacher. I was a sniper instructor. I was all these sort of things. I had literally every single Navy qual possible except for a bundle just because I didn't want to put my back through it anymore. I had literally every qualification. I couldn't go up anymore. Um, but I still was just like, eh, my body can handle it, okay, until my body took over and taught me otherwise. <clears throat> okay. Here we're getting into it, okay. I've, ha I've had so many discussions about sleep. About and I and I can't every, almost every time I get I encounter somebody whether directly whether they're trying to be confrontational or they pull me aside and and would like to re rebuke what I am putting out in terms of this statement. If anybody is saying that six they they do well on six hours of sleep, I'm not I'm not disputing the fact that they're doing well on six hours of sleep, but I'm here to tell you that nine would be better or 10, or 12, okay? Um, I run two businesses. I've, I'm a single father. I get 10 or 12 hours of sleep when I can, okay? Um, I'm not saying that's life. Like, I got it. We're travel and business. I, that's not what I'm saying. But we can never hope to recover what we've lost, okay, in terms of, quite frankly, feeling like crap if we don't sleep. Because here is why. The, the, the hormones that are essential for recovery, recovering the neural pathways, recovering the physical body, uh, recovering mo from emotional stress, any of those sort of things, the only time that your body produces those hormones are during sleep. So uh, I didn't draw the diagram. It's actually kind of hard to find, and which is kind of mind-blowing. So let's say the average, let's, say, let's take the perfect person over an eight or nine, nine hour period, okay? You get nine hours of sleep. We've heard of REM. REM is rapid eye movement, okay? REM sleep, okay? You get typically, ideally, a person will get three REM cycles per sleep cycle, okay? Three. But those REM cycles last at most three minutes. So they, you hit REM, you come out of it. Anybody that's ever fallen asleep before and has been, has been woken up, from, by something, or you have woken up, and you just can't seem to get awake, okay, that is your body, you woke up in REM sleep. Your, the, the chemicals that have been released into your body through your pituitary gland, specifically, and for us men, pituitary gland, to testicles, and so forth, okay, but to, for women, pituitary gland, to ovaries, and so on, <clears throat> you only get, at most, uh, Drugs aside, you can, you can induce it through pharmaceuticals to some degree, which is not healthy. But in a perfect world, nine hours, three REM cycles, nine minutes, that's all you're going to get. If you've bypassed that at all, you will not recover to the extent of the capability of the human body. 
and here I'm here to say is, you, you heard the term, you, you can't bank sleep. You most certainly cannot. You can't. You just keep going, getting worse and worse and worse. But then you're still, some of us are still thinking, well, I still am able to do but, 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 but. Yep, you're right. I averaged three hours of sleep a week in total. I did that for seven years. Three hours a week. So seven days, three hours. That's what I got. That's what I was averaging. Okay? And I was able to do all of what I did whilst being shot at. Jumping, I got 4,000 skydives, 3,500 at night. Okay, I did all of that on no sleep. Okay, so listing a few. Again, I talk about sleep meds. Okay, if you are on any opiate, if you're on any opiate, you will not get into REM sleep. Not possible. Okay, if you are on Lunesta or Ambien, you will not get into REM sleep. If you are on any over-the-counter sleep aid, aside from like magnesium sulfate or citrate, not sulfate, but more citrate, um, Unisom, you will not get into REM sleep. If you are drinking alcohol before you go to bed, you will not get into REM sleep. If you are sleeping with your phone within seven feet of your brain, the chances of you getting into REM sleep are little to none. Okay? If you're, if you're carrying your phone next to your testicles, your body will begin to lessen its production of testosterone. I don't make testosterone because my pituitary gland was destroyed, so I don't really care at this point. Um, uh, so too many concussions, too much, too many blasts. My, my, the sac that my pituitary sits in has been destroyed, so I have to take testosterone every Tuesday. So I'm not scared of needles, but that's not the way I'd prefer to have life be. So listing a few reasons why we don't sleep, okay? Some of them we kind of already talked to stress, overtraining, social, emotional. The list goes on and on, stress. Too much stress that we can't downregulate from. Okay, electronics, blue right. So I think the newest, I just found this out. Has anybody recently updated their iPhone? Like there was a very new update within the last week or so. There is a feature in your iPhone now that turns off blue light. So Apple is brilliant, okay? They were one of the very, those, I think we're kind of all in the same age demographic. Remember those really awesome blue blocker sunglasses, okay? Those are still kind of being in use at certain points. I know the Australian swim team is using them. I'll get into that here in a minute, maybe. But blue light stimulates, okay, st it stimulates. Quite simply, it stimulates. Apple was one of the first companies that put the opposite of a blue light filter on their devices, iPads, iPhones, computers, because it stimulates, okay? It's a brilliant sort of marketing tool. Um, but that's why we, I feel like most of us that have Apple devices, you feel like a little crack, like a little crack, crackhead. You're going like your phone, your iPad, your computer, and you just can't get off it, right? And then you go to your desktop because <clears throat> it's just blasting blue light in your face, okay? All but, and then flat screen TV, same thing. If we've all, some of us say, I assume many of us have been to Vegas. They just pump blue light into, into the, into the uh, oh, they pump pure O2 and blue light into the uh, casinos all by design, okay? So delta pattern, I'll just say that. The delta wave of your brain is the sleep wave, okay? When, you're, when you hear the flow state or you're in the zone or you're in REM sleep, your brain emits a certain wave, okay? It's called a delta pattern, okay? You do not get into delta. or it's, Having a phone near you or a lot of blue light in you, getting into that delta, that flow state, that zone, that REM sleep is, is, becomes very difficult, okay? I won't say it's in, speak in absolutes, but the research is saying that um, prominent research, peer-reviewed research is saying that it's very difficult. So many of us have been injured, okay, pain meds. Because of the, the mechanics of those pharmaceuticals, your body cannot get into REM sleep. But that's, we've experienced that. That's sort of, I get very hypervigilant when I was on pain meds. I just felt like I had to clean and do. And uh, <clears throat> that's why probably I, I stayed on it entirely too long because I felt pretty productive on that stuff. So. Sleep hygiene, I'm gonna get into describe what sleep hygiene is and then caffeine. I'm still at the vice of caffeine, but I don't take caffeine after three o'clock. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it, for me, it has become my acceptable drug. Not too much, I consume maybe, maybe 400 milligrams a day, which, is, which isn't too bad. I'm not really at risk of adrenal fatigue. But we're, we're getting there, so I'm throwing a lot at you, and this is where it's gonna start becoming a bit of a discussion. So, Simply put, but not, not at all, create a routine. What does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> if you pick something in your life that you love, or a hobby, 
um, your family, or something you always prepare for, okay? There, there, even in our chaotic lives sometimes, there's always something we prepare for. It's a routine, it's by design, okay? The best Olympic weightlifters in the world, before they approach the bar, while they have the bar, they do the same thing. Every time Derek Jeter got in the box, he did the same thing. I'm here to tell you that Stephen Curry's preparation to his game is the same time every time. Uh, that's just because I've had a conversation with him. So, um, great people, athletes or otherwise, people that have a great people, in my opinion, great people, people that have a real handle on their lives, okay? That's greatness for me because I had a hard time having a handle in my life. They have a routine. I'm going to tell you what my routine is, ideally, and then obviously I'm not at home tonight, but I still there are still portions of, of my routine that I can continue to adhere to, and the more I do it with frequency, the less I really have to depend on it, okay? So my routine goes like this, and I think I mentioned before where family can either build you up or bring you down, not because the family brings you down, but because you look at it from basically a bystander at that point going, I'm totally screwing my family up myself. My son, so going back to Pavlov, I think it's in here, well, next, yeah, Pavlov, okay, condition response. My son was a little boy, when he still is, but he was, when he was an infant, I would rub the Vicks Vapo Rub on him, right? It's eucalyptus. And I was gone so much that I barely saw him grow up at all for the first four years. But when I, did, and I, when I would come home at times, I just wanted to be around him. <clears throat> so I, I couldn't get in his crib, of course. So what I did is I took the end of his crib off and then I took like a dowel and replaced it so it still wouldn't fall apart, right? Just the top rung. And uh, I would kind of get in there and just lay with him. And I would do that for just while my laundry got done and then I'd pack my bag and I'd leave. That's what I did for, for about four years. So I get a little bit emotional about it, but. <clears throat> so for me, it was a really good, it was, it was the one thing I really had in my life that was important to me, was, was my son. At the time, I wasn't making that connection with eucalyptus and my son. But I mentioned my teachers. Um, I will mention them by name because they, they saved my life. Um, John Sullivan, he is a, he, he's by, many, by na many names, he is a sports psychologist. He's, he's primarily been a sports psychologist for the Patriots for years. He's a Providence College, really very brilliant uh, neuroscientist, sports psychologist. Mark Stevenson, who's a program manager at my former command. Um, and then on the other side, from the sleep side, her name is Shona Halson, H-A-L-S-O-N. She's the director of sleep and recovery for the Australian Institute of Sport. Australian Institute of Sport is a pinnacle of human performance on the planet, not the US. Russia's got some pretty good, good peeps, but Australia's a top dog. Um, and then David Martin, who is a director of AIS, um, who's now with the 76ers. Those are the four people that saved my life. And so, that being said, as I began having these conversations with Shona and, and these people, they were able to, John Sullivan specifically was able to, he said, hey, think back and start, we began having these conversations and for some reason, I began to talk about that VIX. And uh, that was, he's like, that's it. That, that's your condition response. And I was like, what does that mean? So what I did is I went and bought a little bottle of eucalyptus, right? A little, little extract you can get like at Whole Foods or wherever else. <clears throat> and I would just smell it. And instantly, man, I would just chill out. And I'd just sleep like a baby. Just, I mean, it, it, over time, of course. It wasn't, but that first night, though, it elicited a real, real response. And this is how I knew it. it was because of Mr. Pavlov, okay? When you are, you don't know you're doing it. Some of you may. This, might, may, this is how I knew I was doing it. When I, <laughs> it, it, it became a condition response to me because I just always had this habit post-op, if we had hot water, which wasn't very often, I would take a hot shower and just the way to chill me out. So that was another bit of condition response. So I began taking hot showers with eucalyptus oil and I would just start drool, I'd yawn, and I'd start drooling and drooling, okay? You don't know you're doing it, but it's happening. When you're happy during sex, during food, during whatever it is, 
you see it a lot in baseball and football. Why do you think people are always spitting? Okay? They're vagus nervous stimulated. Okay? That sits at the base of your skull. All right? <clears throat> it's telling, your, telling your, your base of your stomach it's fat and happy. Okay? It starts affecting your diaphragm, which talks directly to your SA node. How do we know that's working? Because the vagus nerve, we know that we're stimulated and happy when you drool. Okay? Mr. Pavlov found that out a long, long time ago. So, the long story, the short is my routine. I shut all the lights off in my house except for some strategic candles or night lights, really, or just ambient light from the street. That's my process. Okay, I start there. Now, before I jump into this, I'm kind of all over, so bear with me. Now, it's, it's, it's not always feasible to create this really robust routine, because there are some things out there. So the, the, the National Intrepid Center for Excellence, NICO, in Bethesda, Maryland, it's a fantastic place. Um, the Center for Brain Health in Dallas, Texas, also a fantastic place. And they've worked through a lot of these principles, and they really have gotten some fantastic results. The only thing I have to say about that is that it's hard to sustain that sort of lifestyle. Like, guys will go away. Has anyone here been to NICO? Anyone? Right? I haven't heard too many people say that what I learned there isn't useful, but a lot of them will say, I get back home, and now I have my life back, and it just, it, it's, the, unless you have removed those stressors, you return back to it. And the, and the lifestyle they have set, set, they've created for you, those three to four weeks at NICO, it's not sustainable. Okay, and that's the, pro, that, that's, not that that's a problem, but for us as humans and our unwillingness to concede, it becomes a very difficult task because that sleep patterning and that, hype, that, that sleep hygiene that they set and other things with kids and life and work and all those sort of things, it just doesn't work. It's not sustainable, okay? So that was the big thing. Is like, how do you make something sustainable, right? You don't, create a, you, don't, you don't create a bunch of change. There's too many changing variables. There's too many changing variables. You don't know what worked or what isn't going to work, right? You may be onto something, but you have so many changing variables in your life that you're just like, ah, right? If someone comes to you, and this is one I think, thing, thing I've learned in the professional athletic world, if I go to an athlete and go, and I know they're a mess, I go, stop what you're doing, don't train that way, and don't eat that way, instantly they go, nope. I was really successful getting here. Why should I listen to you? Instead, the approach is don't change how you're training. Don't change your diet yet. That's not what I'm, I'm here to enhance what you're doing. Have you thought about trying this one thing? Take your pillow on the road. Try this. Try that. And then inevitably they go, that's not evasive. That's not too bad. Let's try that. Let's plug that one variable in. And then they can go, that did work or it didn't work. If it did work, great. Here's another piece. If it didn't work, they go, yeah, it didn't really work for me. Okay. Try this. Just one variable at a time. Okay. Oftentimes we get, especially in this state in the military, the true stress, we just go, F it. And they just try to change everything. And then you're like, waiting for it to come. And you're like, When's it going to come? And it never does because there's too many changing variables. Or if it does, and you're like, that's awesome. I feel great, but I don't know what it is that made me feel great. And then you got to change more shit. And you're like, I don't know what it was. So back, on me, back to me. Look at me, everyone. So <clears throat> shut my lights off in my house. My process then begins. That is my sub, sub, you know, we always do that. Who turns their lights off? Who leaves their lights on purposely when they sleep? Nobody, hopefully, right? Um, who brushes their teeth before they go to bed? Most people do. Some of us, especially on the road, I always shower before I go to bed just because of the hectic life, and then I have a shower and I get to bed. There, there's things that we already do. Who, who uses mint-flavored toothpaste, right? Right, everybody, okay? Some of us use electric toothbrushes. It is a stimulus, okay? We just, we just, we, we started, what we do is you want to take tools, things you already do, they're in your subconscious, Bring them to your conscious, okay, and take note of it, okay? The same way you would a training program. It's like, well, i got to get prepared for this marathon. I'm not just going to go, although I did. I run a marathon without training for it. Um, but I was, it was because my sister wanted me to. She, her, her partner quit on her, so I was like, well, I'll go do it. So I did. Um, but I was, in the, I was in a state to do it, though. But my point is, is that I shut the lights off in my house. Okay, I walk upstairs, I check on my son. He doesn't use Vicks anymore, but he uses Burt's Bee shampoo. 
So now it can be verse B's for me. I smell him. I sound a little bit creepy, but I'm okay with that. I smell my son. It makes me happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then I go into my bathroom, and I turn my shower on. And Bruce Lee's thing, Bruce Lee used steam because he would, he'd visualize his breathing, okay? That way it doesn't have to become this, is it working, breathing thing. He would just, he, you could see the steam move as he breathed. So he used steam, okay? So I took that little piece, and I was like, well, now I can, I don't have to vigilantly focus on breathing that I didn't understand to begin with, okay? And then I have a Philips Sonicare toothbrush that I have now, that vibrating stimulus to me has become preparatory bedtime routine. The mint toothpaste, I use the same two different toothpastes, right? And then I go to bed. But before I go to bed, I take eucalyptus and I breathe. And then instantly I start drooling. And about 30 seconds later, I'm snoring. Okay, and I mean that. Didn't, didn't happen overnight, but here's the thing, is that this is all great. All of it's great, got it, it's fantastic. But if you're not doing one thing that really is the easiest thing, you won't elicit or begin to elicit the change that we all hope to have, okay? And it's Mr. Pavlov. Pavlov's the secret, okay? Right here. For, for any of us that have played athletics, for any of us that's ever been on a range shooting a, a, a qual, for any of us that's ever been in a stressful situation to which we had a mentor, a teacher, a parent, or a coach go, just relax and take some deep breaths. What they have failed to tell you is how and why, okay? And it's a really simple, simple thing. And here's the circle, okay? Vagus nerve, we talked about that. I'll tell you where it is and what it is. Diaphragm, SA node, heart, okay? How do I know it's working? Okay, and Pavlov, that's what it says if you can't read it, okay? <clears throat> SA node of the heart is your pacemaker, okay? It sits, heart sits here, pacemaker sits about right there, okay? Superficially, all right? Vagus nerve <coughs> sits. So the base of your skull back here, you have a pituitary gland. About mid-neck, okay, is your vagus nerve down your spine, kind of off, off your spinal cord, okay? And then the diaphragm. The diaphragm, it's interesting. It's, it's actually counterintuitive. The diaphragm, so you have a stomach. The diaphragm sits right here. It's like a big, flat piece of beef jerky, okay? It sits like that. And when we inhale... Okay, it actually goes down. When we exhale, we relax, it goes up, okay? That expiration, so like blowing a balloon or your mom when we were kids are like, Jeff, go clean your room, you're like, eh, right? That forceful exhale stimulates, okay? That diaphragm stimulates that exhalation. That's why yawning, that big exhale, that forceful exhale, that exhalation stimulates the vagus nerve, okay? That's what they mean by deep breath. Diaphragmatic breathing or chest breathing is stress. Think about it. You're in a fight. You've been shot at. You hate somebody. You've been scared. You go, <gasps> chest rises. Stomach goes in. You tense, okay? The opposite of that, you guys are hanging out at home, loving life, watching TV, watching a movie, in bed, and you're chilling, and you just see your stomach. Your chest isn't, chest isn't moving a bit. Your, your stomach's coming up and down. Your vagus nerve is being stimulated. It, it can be, okay? If we chest breathe, we're not going to get there, okay? One of the biggest or one of the most recent pieces of research in enveloping this, which is in a great, great story, is, um, is Red Bull, the free diving. All that, does anybody have uh, Apple TV by chance? If you do have Apple TV, there is a little icon, Red Bull TV. If you go through it, um, there's a couple like four to six minute excerpts of where they took like pra Travis Pastrana and a bunch of other extreme athletes with, uh, I forget, it's not Troy Flanning, it isn't a physiologist for Red Bull, but the, the, the physiologist for Red Bull took all those extreme athletes and took them through like a three or four day course of free diving, okay? And it is specifically on this, okay? How does the average person hold their breath for 30 seconds and then three hours later for seven minutes, okay? And it, everyone, that's the, here's the thing, Here, here's why this is so such a fantastic thing, is because it is my belief, not only because I've experienced it from the inside, but I've experienced it from an outside. Professional athletes, serious mental midgets. They are useless, in my opinion, compared to the population that I was used, wor used to working with. People that would lay down their life 
for the person standing next to them. Okay? That is the population, in my opinion, that has, can make the best use of this, moreover because of the stress inoculation that they've already encountered in that training, in that lifestyle, and the belief that they have in the person standing next to them. Okay? So this is a super, super powerful tool. tool. And how do we know it's working? You will start drooling. Okay? <clears throat> I will say that it's going to take, like anything else, it takes some practice, but not nearly as much as you. I'm ta when I'm talking practice, I'm talking the f you'll be able to elicit yourself to start drooling in probably three to, four or five, three to four minutes your first time doing it. Some of you even sooner, right? It's a really simple concept. Just <sighs> if you do that a couple times, like already, just start, you could feel that. Same idea when you put a lemon in your mouth and your face hurts a little bit, right, and you just start salivating. Same idea. You can elicit that response through breathing, okay, which is why many people, will do, if you do it in a pool, um, you, you can actually, it's called, the, it's called the amphibian response. So if you, anyone has a pool, I'm not saying doing shallow water breath holding. I'm saying if you get yourself in a pool, kind of right up to here, kind of up to your chin, and I know many of us are very, are probably very water competent. And I, I was having these responses without even knowing it. <clears throat> I swam competitively since I was four up through high school. Um, I, I got, I had the opportunity to swim in the regional swim meet and Olympic qualifying swim meet in Florida. I was fairly decent in one particular stroke. It, it helped me in training. I was the fastest swimmer in my buds class. But what I did notice more than anything is at that time, instead of me having to pee every time I smelled, I, had, I found a lot of comfort in it. And I found even more comfort, because I think some of us is going to make sense. When I get in the water and I just submerge myself, I felt like I could just really relax. Okay? The problem is you can't breathe. Okay? But you can still elicit that response. Um, so I'm not, not going to run through peop people through drills here about how to breathe. But understand there's a big difference between chest rise and, and it's, not the, it's not the inhale. It's the, it's the forceful expiration. So there are people that base their entire profession off this. Some people will use a straw, right, because you've got to forcefully exhale through a straw. Some people use a balloon. I just say exhale, just sigh. Just do that a couple times. Now, if you, if you add a scent to that, in my case, eucalyptus, Okay, breathe through the nose, exhale through the mouth, and you will start drooling, which is, again, I, I find myself all the time yawning in the shower, and I've got to catch myself because I'm going to start drooling. In the shower, I don't mind, but it can be a little bit, a little bit obnoxious. So my, my, here's my thing. If you go to the gym, if you have an stressful encounter or anything, and you begin to yawn, don't stop yourself. Okay, That is your body telling you, your brain, your nervous system saying, hey, there's stress coming. Be prepared. Okay, And that is the best way for you to prepare because it's already happening, okay? If you get indigestion, heartburn, diarrhea, loss of appetite, any of those things, <clears throat> embrace them. Understand the link. This is happening because I am stressed out. Stress is good, too much stress bad. But the problem is isn't stress good, stress bad, stress management. It's, it's, it's a nightmare because we just are so used to having that foot on the gas. Okay, and I'm here to tell you that as, as beautifully re as resilient as we are as humans, okay, that shouldn't be the linchpin for us to just write it off as happenstance. Like, oh, yeah, I always have to pee before I, or I always do this, or I always do that, and that's okay. That's just, I'll just, you know, it's not, because I'm here to tell you, you will, there, there is an end point to it. The, the human body will say, it will take control, but the problem is, is when it takes control, you don't rebound back to your 13-year-old self, right, where a fart made you laugh, okay? So that's not the case for me anymore. Like, I guess farts are always funny, but I mean, it's just that my point is, is that doing these little things, again, there, there's sleep, there's sleep things, there's, there's magic this, there's magic this, there's magic this. Does anybody have a, had a stellate ganglion block, anyone? Needle right into the right into the neck. You have a nerve bundle called your stellate ganglion. Okay, some of us may or may not have. Um, that is like taking a band aid for in some cases and putting it over a bullet wound. And the reason why is because 
many people, I'm not, I'm not demonizing, just bear with me here. When we talk about directly innervating the mood or the symptoms of stress, if you do not remove that stressor or begin to manage that stressor, it will get worse, okay? So, um, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm none of those sort of things, but I'm here to tell you that if, if you can, in a, in a, in, in, in very much admittedly, <clears throat> there are people legitimately, and this is, that are, that are legitimately worse off than I am, okay? I just had some really good teachers along the way that cared for me. I, I was in a unique situation, um, and I had a lot of resources available to me. So, but I'm here to say that I've tried it all. Um, I've tried some really crazy stuff that was high-end science, but I didn't live, I, I, I didn't live around the corner from the Center for Brain Health in Dallas, Texas. I couldn't use their, those modalities every day. I just couldn't do it, right? I live, I live in Virginia, so that commute was killer. Um, I had some other things that I've tried, and at the end of the day, what I've, what's, what's, what's worked for me is consistency, okay? Controlling the things that I can control, and I sure as hell can control my breathing, okay? And when stress comes into my life, I will immediately combat it, okay? And I use simple tools. I surround my people, myself with people that care for me, okay? Um, I'm immediately upon getting out of the military, and I know, how many active duty do we have in here currently? We have a few. And let me be also very, very clear. There's three things in my life that I, I consider kind of milestones. Because I don't want you guys to be up here. I don't, I, don't, I don't want you guys to see me up here as someone saying the military is bad. That's not, not at all what I'm saying. Best thing that's ever happened to me is my son. Second best thing, in my opinion, that's ever happened to me is joining the military. Unfortunately, the third best thing that's ever happened to me is getting out. I hit my limit. That's all, that's all I'm saying. I hit my limit. Everyone has different limits. Um, <clears throat> but I think that, uh, you know, every, it, do, it doesn't matter what I say or what I've done. The, the, the unifying factor is that we all right now, we, every one of us here, we could list all sorts of items or all sorts of physical manifestations of stress that we experience in, in a discussion without doctors or neuroscientists or anything, the information that is out there, we could all come to a conclusion as to why, the root cause of why we are feeling that way or why are we getting that physical manifestation if we're honest, okay? And that's a difficult thing too is because, like I said, stress is like a relationship. When you're in it, it is really hard to assess what the F is going on. It's difficult, okay? Which, which is why going back, surround yourself with people who care about you, okay? Also easier said than done, I understand that, which is why my circle is really small. My circle is about six, seven people. That's it. It's not that I don't like people. I don't really like people. I don't like dumb people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just know what my, I know what my bandwidth is for being a good human at this point. My bandwidth used to be eye contact. That's all I could tolerate with people. Now I can entertain a conversation. I can, I can be here right now. So I, I got a text from a group text that Nick was included in the other day about going to Superman and Batman. I'll be honest with you, I, I, still, I still won't go into crowds if I don't have to. Now, obviously, I'm going to go to a movie theater, but I'm going to go Tuesday night or Sunday at 9 p.m. I'm going to sit in a corner where I have a really clear shot of the door. Okay, so. Um, I say that I say that jo jokingly, but Virginia Beach is is a uh, with my my former line of work. It's not exactly a place I like to hang out. I tend to I tend to stay away out of the spotlight. Um, which is if you if you guys do find me on Instagram or Facebook or my business, this is the only trident that you'll ever see with my name. And only reason why this is here because in this environment it's relevant. Okay, for me. I'm not, I'm not, again, I don't, I'm not, I won't be writing a book anytime soon. I won't be putting movies in, and that's, that's their thing, okay? I very much personally believe in not advertising the nature of my job nor seeking credit for what I've done. I truly believe that. The only thing I care about is my son and what he thinks of me, 
Okay, so surround yourself with good people. All right, here's, here's a little bit of magic for you guys. This is, I've given you a ton of information. This right here, has anybody ever been in one of these? Okay, I'm not sure if they're, do, th these, are th these are becoming very, very popular. Um, I won't bother reading the history, 1952, that the first on set was really the CIA. It was used as a torture device, kind of, right? So that was kind of in Nick's and I's introduction as well, the water, we were baptized by water together, which is why we hit it off so well. And if you weren't there, um, it's too bad. So um, the CIA got a hold of it. It didn't take hold very well here in the US in, in the 50s and 60s. It is widely, widely, widely used in high performance in Australia, in Russia, in, which is why. It's an interesting thing is where, where I live in Hampton Roads, it's the number one recruiting bed for college athletes in the country, has been the last four years. We have more recruitable uh, athletes in Hampton Roads than the entire country of Australia. And Australia per capita wins more world championships and gold medals than any other country by five times over. Okay, they develop their athletes and players. Whereas we just kind of, even in the military world, tend to just kind of treat the symptom and not the individual. Back on track, I'll try to stay off my soapbox as much as possible. <clears throat> For this right here, ladies and gentlemen, and we're talking about there's central nervous system upregulation, stress. That's good. You want to upregulate so you can handle. Being in a fist fight on Valium doesn't work very well because I've tried it. It doesn't work very well. Okay? The thing is, is if you, if you continually upregulate, that, 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 those RPMs continue to climb, downregulation becomes a very big problem. And the reason why is because we are a light switch away from stimulus. Okay? TVs, iPads, phones, lights in general. Okay? So when is the last time which is the kind of going back to the reference of being in water, when is the last time you, you non-medically removed all your senses? Smell, touch, sensation, hearing, and sight. When's the last time you were able to do that safely? <laughs> right? It's you're kind of like, what does that mean? Okay, heroin does a really good job of it, but it's not safe um, in other opiates. But again, I'm not a proponent. I, I make light of it because I was a total train wreck. Um, that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the, the cheapest. I say cheap, it's, they run between $25,000 and $35,000 for a unit. Um, most effective for the cost. Way of removing those senses safely. And what that does is this. It's the Control-Alt-Delete for your hard drive, which is your nervous system. Now, just going to get in it is one thing. The, the, former, the, the, the command that I formerly represented um, we, we have, have, had, they, they have, they have four of them. And there is, internally, there, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use my words very carefully here just because I don't want it to be misleading. It was introduced to us, we began going down the road of, hey, there's fantastic physical regeneration possibilities. To be honest with you, we didn't realize that there were some mental, like, really good possibilities in terms of nervous system downregulation involved with them. But that's what we started getting. When using them, guys that had chronic this and chronic that, TBI, no sleep, all these sort of things, anecdotally, we began getting a really positive uh, outcome for the use of these. And the reason why is because once guys got used to, guys and women, began getting used to the sensation of being weightless, truly weightless. Can't see anything, can't feel anything, can't hear anything. And if, now, for many of us, being left with our thoughts can be a pretty scary idea. And that, we found that out too. The claustrophobia, this, that, and the other, became kind of a scary idea. Until we began, instead of just letting people get in, we ourselves, a few of us, experienced them on a daily basis for weeks and weeks and weeks. We said, hey, before you go in, do this, try this, think about this. This may happen, this may not. This may happen, this may not. I'll just empower them with information. Once they had the information, those individuals began seeing much better progress and results. Now, 
I would like to say, I'd like to stand up here and say that we have this irrefutable data, it's peer reviewed and it's widely used. I'm here to tell you that it's not. That was the idea, that's the plan. I have been two years removed from that formal inquiry. I, I, am, I know where they're at, but not really at liberty to say what's going on just because of my respect for the program manager and the, and the organization. Um, not, in a nutshell, if you have an opportunity to get into one of these, keep it super simple, okay? Don't go in the first time thinking it's gonna change your life because it's not, it's gonna freak you out a little bit just because even when you're laying in your bed, you have gravity pushing down on you, you have the bed pushing back. There is stimulus there that you do, you're not aware of. When you remove that, it feels like you're falling. You're gonna get in there and keep feeling like you're falling when to catch yourself, okay? That's going to happen. That's usually the first thing, okay? Once you get past that, okay, some of you may get really hot. I'm like a little heater. I had to crack it. There's a lot of things you can and should do to try and be aware of, okay? Don't go in there having just shaved anything. That is, because there's about 1,700 pounds of Epsom salts in there, okay? You will float. It'll burn like hell. I don't shave anything, so I'm just saying the face and stuff. That was a problem. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't shaved in like eight years, though, so... Um, just there, just know going into this that if, here's the deal, if you're able to get in there at some point after your second, third, fourth, fifth visit and you're able to sleep, get, hold on for the ride because it's going to change your life, all right? That guy right there will change your life if you're able to get in it and sleep, okay? And I mean sleep, not doze off, I'm talking sleep, like time warp. You'll come out of there like you just came out like a baby giraffe out of a womb. Like it's it's pretty impressive. Like it totally changed changes people's lives. Okay, so I I, I can't get, I can't quite get into the. There's so many different individuals that have used it in different ways. But if you have the opportunity, jump in. I'm gonna leave my a way to get a hold of me. Always be able to get a hold of me through Nick. And I've kind of jumped around a lot. And some I'm gonna leave it. I think there's maybe one more slide. But you'll be able to get a hold of me some ways. So like here I said, this is not necessarily the end of the presentation. I'm kind of running on, my, on, on fumes here a bit. And I know there's a, there's a possibility, I totally lost some of you. There's a possibility that I, the light bulb started to flicker a little bit. Um, because like when I, when I did this formal presentation, I did it for about 40, 50, I don't know, PhDs in Canada. And I went into the rabbit hole because that's what they were, they, it, that's just the weird world of PhDs, um, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not knocking them, it's just you just gotta uh, go down that road. And I've done that same presentation to not that individual, and it just totally lost them. Um, I know we're capable of absorbing a lot of information, but uh, I mean, to, to kind of summarize these sort of things is that no, this wasn't overnight for me. This was a long discovery. I've tried about everything you can try to improve sleep, improve, well, improve wellness, performance. Again, my, my background is exercise physiologist and strength coach. That's what I do for a living, really, is I teach and coach athletes. This is all transferable into high performance because this really is where, this is where the rubber meets the road in high performance. Um, and I say that because you take the elite eight in any given sport anywhere in the world. Elite eight means the top eight, top eight cyclists, top eight swimmers, top eight football players. They all look about the same. Their build is about the same. Their diet's relatively the same. Their training's relatively the same. It's the things that they do ancillary to that that brings them up that one to three percent that, that is a, that, that's a game changer. And typically, it's not the training, it's not the diet, it's because they, they've already kind of gotten to that point. Um, these sort of things I learned uh, in Australia primarily, and some places, some, some of the places in the United States, some of it through trial and error. And it, uh, I'm, 30, uh, I'm 37 years old. Um, like I said, double digit combat deployments, 22 concussions, um, shot stabbed, all those good things. And uh, nothing seemed to really work in terms of, hey, try this, take this, do this. When it was all said and done, what I was using is like 
high sport is always up here stressed out, stress, stress, stress. Okay, so I started looking at them going, well, how are they managing it? I mean, because we, the organization I came from, we touted ourselves as being the top. Like, I, we can handle stress. We just can't manage it very well. And so I needed to be, in my head, like I needed to be a high performer all the time. And I, needed lo I wanted longevity. So that's really where this, this road, this, where the rubber road, met the road for me was I want to be 40 years old and being able to run around with my son, play catch, and do all those sort of things. And then obviously still do things that, I mean, I don't do the things necessarily that the military has taught me. I don't shoot much anymore. I definitely don't skydive. Um, they tend to take the fun out of that a little bit. But, um, you know, just, I was all over the place, admittedly. So if you get an opportunity to u utilize these things and some further questions, I'm easy to track down. So I'm done. I got the hook.